Hello everyone, this is Direwolf20 and welcome to a brand new Mod Spotlight. Continuing our series on RF Tools, now we're taking a look at RF Tools Control. RF Tools Control adds a sort of programming type lock, um, but it's not writing code. It's using uh, little icons and opcodes to uh, move stuff around and, and create automation. It's a really nifty mod. It's similar to um, a little bit familiar like uh, to like Steve's factory manager, if you will, but it's, it's definitely different from that. Um, it's kind of hard to describe, so you're going to have to watch the video. Um, it's really nice because there's a lot of complex stuff you want to do in Minecraft sometimes, and sometimes you really want to have super complex automation that just isn't possible with some of the simpler tools we have. Uh, as a result, sometimes you might want to do something really complex like computer craft, but not everybody's capable of using computer craft because they just don't have that Lua programming skill set, and it just seems too hard for them. So this is a nice middle ground in that it's probably almost as powerful as computer craft in terms of what you can do with it uh, once you get your head wrapped around how to do some of like the, the writing of the programs and stuff. Um, but it's also very easy to use. You don't have to write code. You just drag blocks around and, and play with it. So we're going to go over some very simple programs. We'll probably have a multi-part spotlight here where we cover all the different aspects of RF Tools Control. I don't want you guys to be terrified of programming. Trust me, it's really easy to do once you get the hang of it. So give this video a shot, even if you're like, oh, I'm not a fan of programming. Give it a try. All right, guys, so let's get started taking a look at RF Tools Control. So like all RF Tools mods, uh, there is a nice little manual for you to rip flip through here, and you can see RF Tools Control is an add-on for RF Tools, adds a programming system. You can flip through. One of the first blocks you're going to want to make here is the programmer, uh, and then you're going to need the program card item. So you can see that I've got some of these right here. Um, so let's go ahead and get the program card and the programmer, and we'll get started working. So the programmer interface looks confusing at first, but trust me when I tell you it's not. It's not hard at all. Um, basically, you write programs inside this little grid space by dragging these icons on the left over here to the grid space area, and you save them onto program cards by clicking the Save button. It's as easy as that. Um, and then down here, you can edit some of the variables. So let's create a really basic program. I'd like to create a program that just emits a redstone signal. Does that sound easy enough? Let's do it. So to start any program, you're going to need some of these guys called events. This is basically what tells the computer or the CPU or the processor what will cause the program to run. For example, you could say event redstone on. When the computer receives a redstone signal, run the code in the program. Event redstone off. When the program computer is not receiving a redstone pro signal, run the code. Event repeat. This can happen every so many ticks. And if you want to see more details, you can just hold shift here over any of these items, which are called opcodes, to go ahead and figure out what's up. Um, there's other ones like signal, when a signal is received from an RF tool screen or from the processor console. We'll take a look at some of these in a bit. And then there's some graphic stuff we can do, messages, crafting, etc. So we're going to do repeat. So how do we do that? It's really pretty easy. Uh, we take our event repeat, which again, will tell the program to run every so many ticks, and we just drag it on the board anywhere you want. Doesn't matter, okay? And you can see it here indicating event repeat, shift for more info, et cetera, et cetera. Um, it's telling you that it needs a couple parameters though. Um, so let's go ahead and take a look what that means. So you can see down here, ticks is the number of ticks between ex execution. So do we want this to run every 20 ticks, which is a second? So run the program every one second, run it every five seconds, which would be 100 ticks. So let's just click on this little dot here and we'll make it 40. 40 ticks will be every two seconds. The other piece of information you might want to give your repeat event is whether or not it should run only one at a time. What this means is something like, say, for example, your program took five seconds to run, but you said run it every two seconds. Should the program run again before the first time it's done, right? So uh, this is an optional one. We'll say true so that it can only run one instance of this program at a time. So what we've already configured is that every two seconds this program is going to run, but it's not doing anything. Remember I said we wanted to emit redstone signal? So we could scroll through the opcodes here and find stuff for redstone, or we can use these filter buttons at the top. If I tell it to filter on redstone, we're only going to see opcodes related to redstone. There's one here for reading redstone, so we can find out how strong and how uh, whether or not a redstone signal exists on a particular side of the processor. And then we can also set redstone. So let's tell it to set the redstone. When I drag this onto the board here, you'll notice that the green line here has just changed the connector. This means that after this program is done running or after this opcode is done running, it's going to execute the next one, the one that the green dot connects with. Some opcodes have multiple outputs and we'll see them later. But for now, what we can see is that 
after this opcode, which is run every 40 seconds, is uh, triggered, it'll move on to the next one, which is operation set redstone. You'll also see that this little blinking red light in the top right. This indicates that the set redstone command has some important information that it needs to be provided, and it hasn't been provided that yet. What we can tell it is which side of the block to emit the redstone signal on, and what level. Both of these are required, and that's why this thing is blinking. So let's go ahead and configure it to emit on, let's say, the north side of the block, and we'll say a redstone st strength of 10. Cool? Now, at this point, every 40 seconds, it's going to turn on the redstone signal and keep it on. So the first time this program runs, it's going to do something, and it's just going to be on forever. So let's go ahead and make it so that it turns it off after a short period of time. For this, we're going to want the wait operation. What this does is it says it just waits a certain number of ticks. So let's go ahead over here, and we'll tell it to wait 10 ticks, which is about half a second. Cool? So what we see now is that we've got that green dot over here on the right. So after the redstone signal is turned on, it waits 10 seconds. And then we're going to tell it to set redstone again. And this is going to, again, be on the north side. And we're going to set the level to zero, meaning turn it off. Now we have what should be a pretty functional program. So let's hit save, and we'll give it a name. Sample redstone. Great, all the information about this program has now been saved on the program card. Now we need a processor, but in addition to the processor, we're gonna need a few other things. Let's place it down and see what the UI looks like. All right, looks pretty interesting. First, we're gonna to need to give it a little bit of RF power. This thing is not without its costs. Excellent. The first thing that you need to install here is a CPU core, and you see that there are three tiers. The basic CPU core cannot handle one operation per tick. So what that means is one opcode per tick can occur. Uh, you can also get faster ones that can do four or 16 operations per tick, um, and those require a little bit more power. Uh, typically, a basic one should do you at least to start. In addition to this, you might want to install some RAM. Uh, at this point, we're not going to use it because there's nothing we need it for, but we're going to get into variables and how memory is used in the future. You can also throw some network cards in here, which we'll talk about later on in the spotlight as well. So to get this program started, first, we're going to need to insert our program card. This goes into one of the six slots at the top, meaning that processors can handle up to six programs at once. And if you want to be able to run multiple programs at once, you can install multiple CPU cores. Each CPU core can allow it to run one program at a time, and if you want to install more, you're free to do so. Especially if you wanted to configure this repeat event to be single false, you can run multiple instances of the same program at the same time. Pretty cool. Let's go ahead and insert the program card and see what happens. I'm going to find the north side of this block, which is this direction, and I'm going to get some redstone. Nice. Every two seconds, it's activating for about half a second with a power of 10. Pretty cool. The program is doing exactly what we told it to do. And if it didn't, then this mod wouldn't be working right now. So Dyer, this is great. You just created the most complex redstone timer known to man. Can we do anything else with this? Yeah, we can, because there's a lot more opcodes. Tons. Now, I'm not going to talk too much about the console yet, but we're probably going to look at it a little bit more in depth later on in the spotlight. But I should let you guys know that if you type help in here, you can see a list of commands that you can type into the console. For example, one of the commands named signal relates to the event signal over here, where you can tell it to activate a program from the console. So you would use the signal command to do that. You can also type clear in the console to go ahead and clear the list. And you can also list out all the programs that are currently running, and you can see information about each of the CPU cores and what they're doing at the moment, right? So CPU core zero is being used by that program, and it's currently in the delayed two state. It's waiting some time. Neat. There's also some more complex debugging you can do to make it so that it only iterates a step every time you type a command instead of running the program uh, infinitely. We'll probably get into that later on in the spotlight as we cover more debugging options. So as much as redstone is fun to play with, I personally like to demonstrate with the moving of items around. So let's say we want to move items from one chest to another. Let's see how we could do that with some basic programs. I'm going to go ahead and clear the panel here. Note, by the way, that if you really like your program and you need to edit it, you can always pop it in there and hit load and it'll bring it right back. Pretty cool. So as long as you don't save over this program code, uh, you can go ahead and easily retrieve any program you've ever written. Super awesome. 
So let's create a new program that's going to handle item manipulation. And in this case, I want to go ahead and use the event redstone on, basically saying that this thing is going to receive a redstone signal in order to operate. Again, we have the side, the side of the network block. Um, I'm going to go ahead and probably say that this should happen on the south side. Cool. So that is that direction. And to make sure that this thing's ready to go, I'm going to throw a button on there. Great. Next up, uh, we can specify, you know, single, simultaneous or not. We're going to set it to true. So basically, it can only run once uh, until the program's done before it's allowed to run again. So let's start with some basic inventory manipulation. Remember, any blue um, background items will go ahead and get some information for you. So there's a lot of information we can do about external inventories, like the ones that are touching the processor. So let's do something like get number of slots. What this is going to do is choosing an inventory, and we're going to say the side is, um, let's say, up right the block that's above it now the access option is saying which side to access from so for a furnace for example the fuel in the furnace goes in the bottom of the block to go into the bottom inventory and the items that are being smelted goes into the top and the items that you want to pull out are pulled out from the sides that's what the access screen is for you tell it which side to access the inventory from for a chest it doesn't matter all six sides are the same so we're just going to leave it at the star so it can access from any side Cool. We're going to go ahead and count the number of slots that are in there. Now, what can we do with that? A whole bunch of stuff. But what I'm going to choose to do with it is demonstrate the operation log message. And what this does is it outputs a message to the console telling you what it got from the last uh, thing here. So you can choose a couple different things. So for example, my message might be, hello. Now, when I go ahead and save this, we'll call it sample inventory one. And we toss this program into here. What's going to happen is every time I hit the button, it's going to say hello, which doesn't tell me anything about the number of slots in the inventory. That's because I didn't tell it to tell me any slots about the number of slots in the inventory. Instead of the message hello, we're going to say the last opcode result. So there's three buttons at the top here. Constant, which you can tell it what to output. Variable, we haven't looked at variables yet, but you'll be able to store information in variables and retrieve them later. Or function. In this case, we're going to use the last opcode result. There's a couple other uh, functions as well that we can take a look at. Now when we save the program and go ahead and toss it in here and run it, it's going to output 27 because that's how many slots were in the chest above. Cool. If we put a larger chest in there, for example, a diamond chest, and we go ahead and run the program, we'll see there's 108 slots available. Awesome. Now, if we decide that we don't need this program piece anymore, we can simply drag it to the bottom right red square, and it'll just delete those opcodes. So now, instead of actually just looking at what's in there, let's take some information about what's going on in a specific slot of the inventory. And uh, what we can do is maybe say how many items are in a slot. So we can do this one, which is count items external. So first off, again, we have to tell it the inventory. We're going to say it's the inventory above us. And then we're going to look in slot 0, the first slot in the inventory. Uh, we can specify an item to count for, or we can leave that blank, see how it says it's optional. If we specify the item, it'll only tell us the specific item we're looking for. We can also specify whether or not to use or dictionary matching and uh, routable only items, which uh, count when you're doing RF tools. Remember my RF tools spotlight? You can set routable inventories for the storage system. The storage system in RF tools interacts very well with this because it's made by the same author. Um, so let's count the number of items in slot zero. That's all there is. Uh, and I'm going to go ahead and get that output log message again, and we're going to tell it to do the last string that it received. Cool. So let's go ahead and toss this in here. We'll toss a few items into slot zero and press the button to activate the program. We'll see that we got six items. Great. What else can we find out? Well, instead of counting items, let's go ahead and count something else or find out something else. So what we can do is eval, uh, examine item. So again, we're going to say up and we're going to say slot zero. Cool. And let's go ahead and write that to the console. So we're going to bring this up and say last string save. So what kind of information can we find out about this? Hmm, it's still blinking red. Why would that be? Probably because we need this green here. There we go. Save and hit the button. Minecraft cobblestone. Cool. Now, if you don't want to get as much information, you can read more things about it. So, for example, um, when we look at this and we hold shift, we'll see um, that it's getting uh, the eval item 
and you can see which inventory and slots we've specified. But maybe we want to go ahead and find out more information about that item. So let's get name, right? And the way this works is given an item, find out its name. So what item are we going to go ahead and get? Uh, well, we can put the item in there directly, or we can look at the function last item. Cool. Can also convert a string representing registry name to an item or fluid. Neat. And then we can go ahead and export this and save it. So now when we press the button, it'll say cobblestone. Beautiful. You can also do this for damage values. Um, so if we wanted to go in here and instead of getting the name, we want to get the damage on the block. Okay. And we'll say last item. Cool. So we save this program again, grab the program card and cobblestone doesn't really have damage, but my sword looks like it does. Sweet. Damage value of seven. All right. I'm guessing my pickaxe has a different damage value. 71. Awesome. And uh, if we enable F3H with this thing, we should see uh, some information about the damage, right? Those numbers look like they line up. Perfect. So thus far, we've seen some really basic programs, and you're probably wondering, when are we going to see something that might be useful to me? It's great being able to read some information. Hey, guys, this is a tutorial. I'm trying to teach you the basics first. But let's do something a little bit more complex. Let's say that I wanted to keep 10 pieces of cobblestone in this chest at all times. And anytime it dropped below 10, it would refill up to 10. And anytime it went over 10, it would pull items out and go back to being 10. Basically, I always want 10 cobblestone in here no matter what. How could we do that? Pretty simply, actually. We've already figured out how to count items and slots, so we know that there's a way to figure out how many items are in there. Now we just have to figure out a way to move items from one slot to another, probably having this chest be the source. So let's throw a whole bunch of cobblestone in here so that we're ready to transfer it over, and then figure out how we can get it to transfer cobblestone into this chest. Let's start with the basics. All right, on the redstone signal, we might want to move items. So let's go over here and find filter on category items. So these blue ones are always evaluating to find out how many items are in there. So let's start simply by saying operation fetch and push items. Cool. So fetch items will do the following. Um, they will fetch items from an external inventory adjacent to the processor or connected node, which we'll talk about later on in the spotlight. And it's going to go ahead and pull them into the processor. Now the processor block always has to act as an intermediary. It can't transfer items directly from this chest to this one. It has to pull it into the uh, temporary slots over here on the right, which we haven't talked about yet, and then drop it over here. Okay, so what we have to do is act as an intermediary, we have to pull this into this slot. Um, so let's go ahead and tell it to, we'll go ahead and filter on items again, fetch items. Okay, and the inventory we're going to pull from is going to be above us. Cool. The slot is going to be slot zero. And the item is going to be cobblestone. So far, so good. And the amount for now, we're just going to say grab 10. And then finally, it needs to know which slot in the processor to go ahead and place it in. For now, I'm going to say slot zero, and we'll talk a little bit more about this in a minute. The or dictionary and routable options are still available for us. That's all we need to do. So when we save this program and we drop the program card in here, there's one more step that we have to do inside the processor. We have to tell the processor which of these inventory slots are available to the program to interact with. And to do that, we just click on this resource allocation button. This is also used for memory and uh, variables when we get to that point. Basically, it lets us choose which of these slots this program can interact with. So if I choose these three slots, you'll notice that that is inventory slot 0, 1, and 2. When I remove the resource allocation, it's going to go ahead and have these three available. So it can write to variable slots 0, 1, and 2. Cool. So it can move items into these three slots and only these three slots. Now when I run the program, click it should have moved 10 cobblestone in there. Every time I run the program, it's going to move 10 more cobblestone because that's all I've told it to do so far. So to continue with the theme of building this simply, the next step is we're going to want to move items from this internal slot over to the chest on the right. So let's go ahead and take a look at doing that. So we're going to use the filter category and we're going to say push items. So after we fetch the items into the inventory, we want to push them. Where do we want to push them to? The inventory adjacent to the network block. That's going to be on the north side. Doesn't matter what side we pipe them into, top, bottom, left, right. If this was a furnace, it would probably be the top slot that we want to push them into. All right, slot number will again be zero. So we'll make that constant zero. And then amount. So we're going to say how much do we want. We're going to say 10. 
Cool. And then the slot in the processor that we want to pull from is going to be slot zero. That's all there is to it. Save the program. Cool. So we've just told this now every time you push the button, grab 10 cobblestone, pull it into here. Then next step will be grab whatever's in the slot, grab 10 of them and shove it over here. Press the button and we should see it in there. Sweet. So again, we still have it so that every time I press the button, it's gonna drop 10 cobblestone in there. Press it again, 10 more. Press it again, 10 more. That's not what we want. We wanna have it so that every time it has 10 in there, it's good, and if it has six, for example, it'll move four. So how do we figure that out? Well, we basically need to say, when we go ahead and look in there, let's say there's eight, we know we want 10, so we do 10 minus eight is two. That's how many more we need to add. So we need to do these evaluations inside the program. Let's figure out how. So the very first thing I'll probably want to do before I start moving items around is evaluate the number of items in that slot. So first we'll do eval count items external. Remember this counts the number of items in a slot. So we'll look at the inventory on the north side and we'll count the items in slot number zero. Cool. And we could tell it to count cobblestone, but in this case, well, why not? Let's do it. Count number of cobblestone. Great. Or dictionary and routable, I'll leave blank. So now this opcode is gonna go ahead and count the number of items that we want. Now we're gonna to wanna to use this number two, for example, if it were two, let's say what's gonna be two. We're gonna to wanna to use this number two in multiple spots. So the best way to handle this is to store it in a variable. So this case, we're going to wanna to use the operation set variable opcode. What this does is copy the last return value to a specified variable, okay? And it's pretty simple, you give it a variable. So we'll call it variable um, zero, cool. So let's go ahead and move these fetches right here for a moment. Um, and instead, what we're gonna do is write the variable to the console, just as a demonstration, okay? So our message is gonna be variable index zero, okay? So in this case, we're going to find out how many items are in the north inventory in slot zero, store it in variable number zero, and then write whatever's stored in variable number zero to the console. Cool? So we can go ahead and hit save. And we're gonna go over here and run the program. Error, missing variable. We haven't talked about variables or RAM. So let's go ahead and look at what that's all about. So we're going to need RAM chips in order to interact with variables. And simply inserting them into the processor like so is going to open up variables available to you. But you also have to alloc allocate those to the program. So we're gonna make variables one, two, three, and four, or zero, one, two, and three, available to this program to run. Now, when I go ahead and hit the button, it's going to write out the number eight. Because what happened is it looked at the stack in here, counted that there were eight items, stored it in variable number zero, which you can see, by the way, if you click on it, it says eight, because the last time this program ran, that's what was stored in this variable. Then it wrote the variable contents to the console. Pretty cool, right? If I split this in half and made it four, when I click the button, four is gonna be stored in the variable, as you can see, and it's gonna write four to the console. Cool. Now we need to do a little bit of math. So let's do some math, and I'm gonna do more with variables than I need to. Technically, I won't have to use as many variables as I'm about to, but I really want to demonstrate this simplistically for those who might not be following along as easily as others. So now we want to subtract integers. So what do we want to do? We want to just say 10 minus whatever is in variable zero. So it's really simple. Variable one will be the number 10. And then we want to subtract whatever is in variable zero. Cool. So that should be 10 minus four, we should get six. And what we're going to do is store that in another variable, okay? Operation set variable, variable one. Cool. And then over here, um, we can go ahead and do this. And this guy will write out what's in variable one. Does that sound cool? So save the program. So there's four items in here, right? So this should write the number six to the console, and it did. Variable zero is still four. How many items are in the chest in the north slot? Variable one is the number six, which is 10 minus four. For example, if we had, let's say, nine in there and we ran the program, we'd see variable zero is nine and variable one will be 10 minus nine, which is one. Finally, what we wanna do is use that variable in slot variable one to go ahead and move the items. So we bring back these fetch functions that we had before and we're going to say, 
the amount of items to fetch instead of a constant 10 will be the variable that's in variable index one. Remember that's 10 minus whatever the number is, right? So that's gonna move that variable number of items into this internal temporary inventory slot. We're also gonna to wanna to do that in the push. So the amount will again be the variable in index one. Cool. So what this is gonna do now is it's gonna say, hey, go look in the inventory above me, find cobblestone in slot zero, grab whatever variable number one says to grab and pull it into my internal inventory in slot zero. Then from my internal inventory slot zero, take whatever amount is in variable one and push it to the chest north of me. Let's give it a try, shall we? If we go ahead and run this program, it should move one item exactly. Cool, awesome, because nine is in there, one's how many to move, and that's how many we wound up moving. If I push the button again, nothing's gonna happen because currently there's 10 in there and we told it to move zero. Sweet. If I split this in half and we push the button again, it's gonna say there were five in there. I told it to move five more and we're back to 10. Awesome. And if I wanted to, I could have this repeat every second. So instead of running on event redstone, we could tell it to run on event repeat. And we're gonna tell it to run every 20 ticks, which is every one second. And we'll tell it to be yes, only one at a time. Cool. If we save this now and we hit okay, and we go ahead and toss this in here, it's going to run every second. So every time I remove items here, within a second, it should replace some and get me back up to 10. Awesome. But we have a problem. What happens if I have more than 10 items in there? Well, we're gonna have some errors because we're trying to transfer negative five items. That's not good. Also, I wanted my program to pull those extra five out and throw them into the inventory above, didn't I? Yeah, that would be cool. So we know under certain conditions we wanna move items from this chest into this one, but in other conditions we might wanna move items from this chest back to this one. Let's go ahead and see how we can do that. We're gonna to wanna to evaluate the number of items in the chest on the right first. Basically, the condition we're looking for is how many items are here. If it's less than 10, we're gonna probably wanna pull from the chest on top and pull them into here. But if it's more than 10, we wanna move it from this chest back into the top one. So let's find an evaluation. It's probably gonna be down here somewhere. So the opcode we're probably gonna to wanna to use is right down here and it's called test greater than. What it does is it tests if the first value is greater than the second value. So what do we wanna check if it's greater than? What is greater than what? We wanna know if the items in this slot are greater than 10, right? So we're gonna grab the variable that we stored how many items are in that slot, which is variable zero. And we're gonna to check to see if that is greater than 10. Now in this case, we have two different pathways we can follow. There's the green one and the red one. This is the first time we've had a split, okay? Green is gonna be if it's true. So basically, yes, if it's greater than 10, it goes down the green path. If it's not greater than 10, it's gonna go down the red path, okay? So we'll let the red path be what happens for the operation fetch items, okay? And then we're going to have a similar operation of fetching items. Uh, however, in the reverse direction on the green path. Okay, so if it's not greater than 10, meaning that if it's less than or equal to 10, go ahead and figure out how many items we need to transfer. However, we have a problem. I've gone ahead and figured out how many items to transfer before I got to my test. I should probably do that after the test. So let's go ahead and move some things around. Easily, we can move our opcode values like that. So now we figured out how many items are in the slot in variable zero, and we wanna go ahead and if the number of items there are greater than 10, we want to take the number 10, subtract the second val the value in slot zero, store that in variable one, and then move our items from the inventory above to the inventory on the north. We wanna do the opposite over here, right? If it's greater than 10, right? So if our example is 15, we wanna do 15 minus 10 to figure out that we have five to move, right? So what we're gonna do is another subtraction metric and we're going to say the first value, which is variable zero, how many items are in the slot in the north inventory, minus 10. And then we're gonna store that in a variable, and it can be the same variable, it can be variable one. Cool? 
And then what we want to do is we're going to want to transfer items from the north inventory in slot zero, item cobblestone, which we didn't have to tell it was cobblestone, but we are just for this demonstration. The amount will be the amount that's in variable one, and we're going to store it in slot number zero inside the processor, which is this one. Cool. And that should be all we need to do for this guy. We could also optionally have told it or dictionary support, but we're not going to. Right, And then we're going to do the operation push. So you're going to push uh, from slot 0. The amount is going to be that variable, which is variable 1. Um, the internal slot is 0. And the inventory we're pushing to is the one above us, the up inventory. So here's the test, right? Greater than, so if the amount of items in this slot is greater than 10, then what we want to do is take the number of items in slot and subtract 10. So let's say it's 15. It'll be 15 minus 10 is 5. Then set that into variable 1. We're going to move 5 items from the north inventory to the up inventory. If it's less than 10 or equal to 10, we'll do whatever's there, 10 minus that number, and then just like we did before. So this should work pretty well. I don't know if you guys caught my mistake, but it took me a little bit to catch. I accidentally made this be constant 0, maybe, instead of variable 0. So now that I've fixed that, uh, my program should be working. So let's hope that I'm correct about that. Um, and let's go ahead and run the program. Cool. So if we take a look here, we should see that if I put uh, less than 10 items in here, it should pull them back in and make it 10. Sweet. And if I put more than 10 items in there, it should subtract the items and make them 10. Awesome. Now keep in mind, by the way, that the slot that you interact with is optional. So when I uh, go ahead and pull out of the slot, it should always be slot zero in the north inventory. But the one that we put it into in the uh, up inventory, we'll leave that blank because it really doesn't matter which inventory slot we interact with up here because we might run out of a cobblestone in slot here before the other slots. And in that case, it would probably be a problem. So the same for this one. When we're pulling out of the up inventory, we'll make this an empty variable, meaning it can pull from any slot. Cool. I've also gone ahead and changed the variable amounts. So the variable one is for the down one, but the one where it's greater than, it's variable two, just to make it easier to demonstrate. So that, just so you guys can see this, uh, before we wrap up part one of the spotlight, um, when we look at variable zero here, we'll see it's 10, and the amount that we need to move is zero. Um, when we go ahead and remove some items, we'll see that the amount we needed to move was three in that case, because it moved it to seven. So the program is moving pretty quickly now, right? Um, when we have too many items in there, it goes ahead and stores in variable two. We had to pull five out. Nice. So everything's working pretty well. So for example, if I throw a couple stacks in there, right? It can easily transfer those items out and store them up here, regardless of what inventory it's in, right? And even if I take out slot zero, if I move some of these items away, it should find cobblestone in the chest above in the next slot because I'm not specifying the slot for the move. Cool, right? So that's gonna wrap up part one of the RF Tools Control Spotlight. We've written some very basic programs here and I hope I've given you the fundamentals of how RF Tools Control works. There's a whole ton more to check out. Um, we haven't even scratched the surface of what it's capable of interacting with. It can interact with redstone levels, it can interact with fluids and move them around, it can investigate details, it can auto-craft, and it can do a lot, lot more way more than we've seen here today. But this intention of this video was to give you guys the basics. My recommendation is if you're interested in playing with RF Tools Control, just start playing with it. Don't be intimidated, don't be afraid, don't say I can't figure it out. I guarantee you, you can figure this out. This is not hard. Follow my video, go through this sequence of steps that I've just outlined for you, and make sure that you're following along exactly with what I'm doing, and then start playing with it. Come up with something you want it to do. I don't want it to keep 10 items, I want it to keep 20. Change my program and make it keep 20. And play around with the outputting of messages, right? The outputting of messages, which is a very nice debug message, it helps you to follow along and know exactly what your variable, variables and values are doing. So trust me when I say that's a super important thing. Just start playing with the mod. I promise you, you will figure it out and you'll have fun and it's the type of thing that will be good for you to know how to do because it helps you think logically and break down your sequence of problems into individual steps. Once you've got those individual steps defined, you can write them inside this little program and you're good to go.
Cool. So no programming, no typing, no coding required. You just go ahead and throw some cards on a board and you've got a really cool automation thing that is a lot of fun to play with. All right, for now, Dial20 is signing off. Hope you enjoyed part one of the RF Tools Control Spotlight. Part two will be coming quite soon. All right, guys, take it easy.